Our speaker really needs no introduction. We've all known him for a good many years. Uh, when I first met him in the Mises seminars way back in 1950, 51, and so forth, he was going for his doctorate, and he was having his troubles up at Columbia, where he got all three of his degrees. And finally, when uh, Eisenhower was kind enough to inflict Arthur Burns on us the first time, <laughs> why, Murray was able to get by with his <laughs> thesis, The Panic of 1819. And he had to rewrite it and rewrite it and rewrite it because they wouldn't accept uh, the philosophy of Mises. And Dr. Rothbard, as you all know, is quite an individualist. He's, uh, of course, written a number of books besides this Panic of 1819. I hope most of you are familiar with his man, Economy in the State, and America's Great Depression. And his little pamphlet on money. What has the government done to our money? Uh, Murray is an individualist. He's flirted with the new left, but uh, he's uh, got disenchanted with them for a little bit, and uh, he asked them to rest in peace, and now he's calling them the loony left. <laughs> in his latest publication. He's also editor of this Libertarian Forum, which some of you may be familiar with. And uh, Murray, of course, has followed uh, the economic situation for a good many years, and he is more or less a contemporary of Dr. Friedman, whom he's going to talk about, Milton Friedman, who has been selected by our opposition as our representative of the free market. But uh, he's not in accord, of course, with many of our things, but this is what Dr. Murray Rothbard is going to tell us about it, and it gives me pleasure to present Dr. Murray Rothbard. Yes, sir, any way you wish. Well, thank you very much, Percy. Don't throw bricks. All right. Uh, the pleasure of being here again. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not quite a Milton Friedman's generation. I'm not quite, uh, it's sort of a petty point, but I'm a little bit younger than he is. Insert <laughs> <laughs> that into the record. <laughs> uh, I think a lot of us, a lot of people seem to, seem to have been afflicted with uh, an excess of Friedman worship. So I'm not going to stress the, the, the good points that Friedman has done uh, in the past few years. I think um, most people are familiar with it. Uh, I, might, I might even be so unkind as to paraphrase uh, when Friedman's mentor, Henry Simons, <clears throat> I uh, wrote an article about Alvin Hansen one time, Hansen being the top uh, left-wing Keynesian in the past years, now more or less retired. Uh, he wrote an article saying, <clears throat> he began the article by saying, I come to bury Hansen, not to praise him. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I can say the same thing about Friedman tonight. Uh, in the first place, <clears throat> uh, one of the problems with the, with the, the press in general <clears throat> is that uh, the, the press has a very short memory, so if somebody comes up with an idea uh, and uh, nobody said it for the last three years, it's, uh, it's immediately hailed as a great new idea, a great new discovery. And the, the same thing has happened to Friedman. Almost everything he says is a complete reincarnation <clears throat> of what, for example, Irving Fisher had said <clears throat> 40 years ago, 30 years ago. But <clears throat> since the collective memory of the press and even the economics profession is very short, uh, Nobody points this out. So Friedman has discovered all sorts of so-called laws, uh, which are simply rediscoveries or restatements of uh, what Fisher had said clearer, <clears throat> more in a clearer fashion, uh, 40 years before. Uh, for example, there's a famous law that Friedman is supposed to have discovered a year or two ago that the interest rate rises uh, during inflation, especially during the later stages of inflation, because as prices are going up, we have a discount, a, a positive price discount. Uh, uh, premium, rather, a positive price premium on uh, the interest rate to account for the uh, prices rising. So that the, uh, if the creditor is demanding a 6% return, for example, and prices are going up 6% a year, obviously you have to ask a lot more than 6% to, uh, to overcome the inflation. Uh, so Friedman's supposed to have get, had this great new discovery, and the economics profession is now sort of a tizzy in a tizzy about that. Of course, Fre Fisher had said the, exactly the same thing uh, for about 40, 50 years ago, and Professor Mises had said the same thing in his work and so forth. But uh, they say the collective memory of every of the press and the economics profession is very, very short. Uh, and this is, uh, as I will point out later on, this is true of, of Friedman, uh, Fisher's, uh, excuse me, Friedman's general theory about money in the business cycles. <laughs> Essentially, Fisher rediscovered and with a lot of statistics added on to it. Uh, <clears throat> 
I'm going to talk tonight essentially about the political rather than the methodological critique of Friedman. I could say a lot about the methodology, but I think uh, in this sort of gathering, I think we can stress the political economy aspect. I just want to say in passing that Friedman is the, probably the outstanding proponent <clears throat> in methodology of uh, an extreme variant of logical positivism. In other words, the, the, the major, major opponent of Professor Mises' methodology, so to speak. Uh, mm -hmm. Friedman is so extreme that he says that uh, assumption and, and a theoretical assumption doesn't have, not only doesn't have to be proven, it can even be false and still be a correct theory. It doesn't matter if the assumptions are false, he says, as long as the predictions are correct, which are based on these false assumptions. So this is a, an extreme version of, um, of positivist methodology. <clears throat> and I'm saying this is the exact counter to everything that uh, praxeology holds dear. Uh, but I said, I don't want to talk about methodology t uh, tonight. I just want to mention that in passing. Uh, first, uh, and I'm not going to deal too much with this either, is the, the whole field of monopoly and competition. That's true that in practice, uh, Friedman has come a long way from the original Henry Simons position. The original Henry Simons position, which was written in a, in a really screwball book, I think in 1934, called A Positive Program for Laissez-Faire, which I recommend everybody read because it's really the, it really states the, the Chicago school position <clears throat> very clearly, the political position of the Chicago school, uh, with great clarity. And essentially, Simon said was that every corporation above the size of a small blacksmith shop should be broken up, by trust, be trust busted by the government, and reduced down the blacksmith shop size so that we can all have perfect competition. We can enjoy the benefits of perfection and competition. <clears throat> and uh, this, I say, was the original Chicago position. It come quite away from that, ha happily. Uh, and Friedman today doesn't take this position. He says, well, he recognizes that the major source of monopoly today is, is government privileges, government regulation and subsidies and so forth. But still there's a canker there. The theory is still there. <clears throat> the theory being the Chicago position of perfect competition, in quotes, is better than imperfect. In other words, that a firm with a constant demand curve, a horizontal demand curve, is somehow better and superior and more pure, less uh, and more moral than a, than a firm in a state of which faces a falling demand curve. So this idealization of perfect competition still remains, even though it's, it's, it's played down now in practice <clears throat> in the Friedman position. But it's still there to, to, to plague us in the future, because uh, uh, sometime in the future we'll get, we'll get this. Uh, we'll again hear the cry from the Chicago school that such and such a corporation should be broken up because it's too big and it's facing a falling demand curve and so forth. We can expect it at any time, let's put it that way. Uh, just as Professor Stiegler, uh, Friedman's most distinguished associate uh, said about 15 years ago, the U.S. Steel should be broken up into, into, into its constituent parts because it was monopolistic. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know if he still says that. He's come a long way, too, from the last 20 years. But as I say, the theory, theoretical structure still remains. But I don't want to deal too much with monopoly and competition either because this is, again, a more a theoretical than a political position at the present time. Let's get to the, the Friedman's big argument for government intervention in general, which is the so-called neighborhood effect. <clears throat> Um, and it's particularly, I want to talk about the external benefit part of neighborhood effect. Uh, in other words, the idea that uh, if two or three people are doing something which another set of people are benefiting from but aren't paying for, this is a terrible, terrible thing, and these people should be forced to pay for it. This is one version of it. And now, in practice, again, in practice, Friedman doesn't push this to a great extent. He essentially says, well, this is really limited. Uh, we limit the application of this to... Uh, urban parks, Central Park, and so it should be governmental because you can watch the park and not pay for it, and therefore uh, it's a terrible thing, you should be forced to pay for it. And also education, which is another big, of course, a very big uh, item, which is in favor of government being up to its neck in for the same, for the same reason. But as, in general, he restricts it more or less to those areas. <clears throat> but what my contention is that it can be used, the same argument can be used for almost anything, to justify almost any act of government intervention whatsoever. That Freeman is really unjustly limiting it once you accept the argument. Uh, for example, if uh, one of my favorite examples, which I always use in class, is that uh, if people are, people are enjoying, for example, men are enjoying in particular, uh, the sight of girls watching mini, uh, wearing miniskirts. And of course, this is on the way out. But it's, <laughs> this is uh, up till now, they've been enjoying the sight of girls wearing miniskirts. <clears throat> and they've been enjoying it without paying for it. In other words, here we have this aesthetic uh, benefit or psychic benefit <laughs> which you're not being forced to pay for. And so therefore, the Freemanite argument should be that we should all be taxed to pay girls to wear miniskirts. And this would, this would iron out the external benefits and smooth out the, uh, you know, 
neighborhood effects. <coughs> and uh, and similarly, this goes for almost anything else. If, if one of us, for example, becomes a wiser person by reading a great book or something, you know, reading Socrates or whatever, and he becomes wiser by this wisdom, he benefits other people along the way, and therefore they should be taxed to subsidize him reading Socrates, and so forth and so on. It's, it's almost an infinite. Uh, and this whole uh, approach seems to me to be uh, uh, you know, very peculiar. In the first place, it, it really means we should we should all wear sackcloth and ashes because we're all free riders. This is really an attack on the free rider, but we're all free riders on the, the, the discoveries of the past, the writings of the past, the, the technical inventions, the capital investment of everybody who's gone before us. We're all, we're all getting the benefits of this without paying for it, in a sense. And, you know, does that mean we should, we should beat our breasts and tear our hair and, and be taxed by somebody <clears throat> in order to somehow pay for this, uh, you know, uh, to suffer for these benefits that we're, that we're enjoying? It's a very peculiar kind of theory. And so what I'm really saying is that free riding, which Friedman is trying to attack here with the neighborhood effects, is really uh, an essential part of civilization altogether. And if, we want to, uh, uh, if we want to abandon free riding, we really have to abandon the fruits of civilization. <clears throat> Uh, now, when I've talked to Chicagoites, Freemanites, about the miniskirt analogy, by the way, they admit that this is correct, but they say they wouldn't push their theory that far. Well, you know, why not? I mean, this is, uh, of course, again, rest the, again, we, we talk about the, the rule of logic in political policy. And, of course, those of us in favor of logic, I think, uh, have a point there. <laughs> uh, there's another part of the theory uh, that if, if you're sort of the, the other side of a coin of the free rider, is that if you can do something which will benefit other people and you're not doing it, they should be able to force you to do it. Uh, if you're not conserving copper or something like that sort, and this, this conservation will help people, you should be, be able to be forced to do it. My favorite analogy there is the case of three, or four guys, three guys who are, who are uh, playing a string quartet. There's a fourth guy who, can, who could play the cello, but it's sort of recalculated and doesn't want to do it. And the theory then should say they should be able to force him to play the cello because this will benefit all three of them. So, <laughs> And uh, this, again, is part of the neighbor. I'm not saying Friedman says this, but I'm saying is he should be saying this if he were a consistent uh, neighborhood effect theorist. <clears throat> uh, so there's so much, I think, for neighborhood effects. But I'm saying this is Friedman's major argument for uh, government intervention in almost any area that he thinks is, you know, the, the, the argument applies, such as education. Uh, okay, now, now, now to get to a point uh, which I think is the most is probably, and this is of course a value judgment, I think it's the, probably the single most disastrous economic idea ever invented, which is the idea of the negative income tax or the guaranteed annual income. <clears throat> uh, of course, here again, this is an interesting situation. Uh, Friedman coined the idea of a negative income tax. In other words, a, uh, a, min a guaranteed minimum income floor for everybody. This became the inspiration for more, more uh, radical schemes such as Robert Theobald and the Ad Hoc Committee of the Triple Revolution and so forth and so on. And also, of course, for Nixon's current welfare program. <clears throat> uh, the, the problem with the national negative income tax is that it provides an income floor by right. In other words, as a, as a, as a <clears throat> rightful claim, as an automatic claim upon production. It no longer becomes the sort of thing we have to go to the welfare department and sort of hat in hand and fill out forms and say you really deserve it and they, they don't think you do and you have to argue about it which is sort of a degrading thing, now it becomes automatic. You fill out your income tax form, you say you've gotten less than the prescribed floor, and you get the money <clears throat> in a couple of weeks. Now this, <clears throat> what I'm saying here is that the present welfare system, as crummy as it is, as bad as, bad as, as it is, as, as inept and as in inefficient and bureaucratic as it is, is precisely saved from disaster by the very ineptness, that's very bureaucracy and very inefficiency. Because it means that the whole system of going on welfare first place is, is chaotic, so it's not automatic. Second place, it's unpleasant. You have to go through all these bureauc these tin horn bureaucrats uh, to justify being on welfare and get inspected and so forth. And this very unpleasantness provides an extremely necessary disincentive effect to prevent people from going on welfare. This is the incidentally the, the original, the old 19th century laissez-faire liberal position. If you have to have welfare at all, it should be very, very unpleasant. <laughs> so as to discourage people from going on it. Uh, <clears throat> And the Freeman theory, in the, in the name of efficiency and simplicity and automatic and automaticity and so forth, eliminates this very essential unpleasant feature. It makes the thing, as I say, automatic. Uh, what we have to realize is that there is a supply function or a supply curve for going on welfare. <coughs> and the various empirical studies have shown the quantitative importance of this. 